The town was founded back in the 20s when some of Barnum and Bailey's troops started coming down here during the winter off seasons. You know, this town's history might help explain our case's history. A sideshow performer would have toured much of the country over the years, and their isolation from everyday society caused by their physical deformities could have built up pathological resentment so intense that murder might... No, 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 hold on a second. Around here, we refer to them as very special people. Now, some of them may be different on the outside, but it's what's inside that counts, and on the inside, they're as normal as anybody. Discovering the X-Files, the podcast in which a newbie takes a deep dive into the entirety of Chris Carter's universe, while longtime fans escort me on the journey, a perilous journey filled with government conspiracies or weird monsters every other week. I'm Eric's Antoine, and today I'm joined by film critic and fellow podcaster Zaki Hassan. We'll be discussing Humbug, which originally aired on March 31st, 1995. In this episode, Mulder and Scully investigate a series of murders in a community of former circus sideshow performers. This is the first episode to be written by Darren Morgan, and it was directed by Kim Manners. It also features quite a few interesting guest stars. Jim Rose and The Enigma both appear as fictionalized versions of themselves, along with little person Michael Anderson, who most of you might remember from Twin Peaks, and Vincent Chiavelli, the legendary character veteran of genre film and television. But if you want, just remember him as Mr. Vargas. And now, Zaki and I are going to get into it. Stick around. Hey, so welcome. Welcome to the podcast, Zachy. Uh, this is, uh, it's really great to have you here. Um, you know, it's, a, it's just, it's fun. I mean, I, I saw that you were an X-Files fan and thought that it would be really great to have you sit down and talk about an episode. So well, it's good hey, to have well, you. I, I, I just started a, a watch through with my kids and this is really my first time going through the series uh, in its entirety since it uh, aired. So it's, I'm, I'm having a fun time going through it again as well. Right. Well, actually, I had a question because this is your first time on this podcast, so this is kind of what we do. Um, so why don't you, I'm going to let you start off, give me a little of an idea of your relationship to the X-Files. Oh, my gosh. I, I watched the show pretty much right when, when it started. I think the very first episode I saw uh, was either the second or third one. And so it was, you know, I, I, I get to say I was there basically from the ground floor, and it was fun to sort of see it go from a a cult hit very much like under the radar to to really becoming uh mainstream in a big bad way i was i was in high school when it started so this is for it started uh i was a freshman in high school when it started so it's something i really heavily associate with with that time of my life you know specifically my my high school and college years Right. Yeah. And as you, I mean, from what you're telling me, so you liked it, quote unquote, you liked it before it was cool. Right. Uh, I know, which is such a like, I hate, <laughs> I hate when people say that. But I mean, it's, it is the truth. I uh, it, it was uh, Friday nights. It was uh, the adventures of Briscoe County Jr. And and X-Files came on after that. And I was I was more interested in Briscoe County Jr. And I was like, oh, I guess I'll watch this X-Files thing, too. And it's just funny how how things go where. Briscoe is like, you know, one and done, and and X-Files is ubiquitous, uh, arguably, still. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, actually, since you brought up Briscoe County Jr., which, like, I'm a huge Bruce Campbell fan, but I never really followed that show. And by the time I got around to wanting to watch it, it was it was gone. So, <laughs> but, but I have a friend of mine who is, like, a big fan of it, and he resents the X-Files. He resents the X-Files. Like, he blames the X-Files for the cancellation of Briscoe County Jr., which makes no sense to me, because if anything, the X-Files should have helped Briscoe County, you know, if, if yeah. Briscoe County was the lead-in. Uh, so I, I really don't get that that mentality. Um, <laughs> but but anyway, that's, yeah, that's how he, that's where he stands on that. Interesting. 
It um, is a good show. If you ever get a chance to watch it, it is good. It is worth watching. Well, is it like streaming anywhere or is it like, a, I mean, is it, because it was just one season, right? It was one season. Um, the DVDs, last I checked, were relatively easy to acquire. But but as far as I know, um, I mean, this is, you know, not 100% above board, but uh, it is all on YouTube. Oh, well, I mean, it's on YouTube. And if no one is pulling it from YouTube, I think yeah. that that makes it fair game. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> as, as far as if it's there and no one's complaining. Yeah, yeah. Last I saw, it's there, and it looks like a, re- a DVD rip, so pretty decent quality. All right, well, uh, maybe I will check it out because, as I said, I am a Bruce Campbell fan, so why not? Um, okay, so that's your that's so you're basically a longtime fan. You watched it from when it first aired. You watched it throughout its run. I assume you've even seen the revival, which I haven't seen, obviously. Um, but uh, uh, so you are someone who's been with the show from the beginning up until now continue to be with the show uh, as a fan. So where do you stand? Here's the other question that I'll ask you. Where do you stand in terms of the whole monster of the week versus mythology? Like what kind of fan are you? Are you a monster of the week a fan or are you a mythology fan? Are you a bit of both? Like what's your position there? Uh, my my preference is the, the, the one and done episodes. I, I like the you know, kind of like the one we're going to talk about today. And just, just generally, I think, I, I think the mythology, the mythology does not hold up as well for me now. And without spoiling anything, I just, to me, it, it's less about what they do or do not reveal than the sort of the, the and I, I mentioned this on social media, the, the, the paranoia that's sort of laced into it is sort of unnerving to me, given that we're getting real life examples of what happens when anti-government po- paranoia runs amok, if that makes any sense. Uh, I completely understand what you're saying. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that that's unfortunate to me. Uh, I, I think to me, when I think back, I'm like, oh, that was a good one. Oh, that was a good one. It's usually, it's the one-offs. It's where Mulder and Scully like are called into a case and they encounter, you know, the fluke man or the this, or, you know, that's the stuff that, yeah. that tends to, to last better. I mean, there's a couple good good mythology episodes, but just in general, I don't uh, definitely like on this rewatch. I I do sort of just check out. You know, my kids are into it. They're they're like following along with all the the you know the Erlenmeyer flask and all this stuff and whatever. And, mm-hmm. and I, I'm kind of like, okay, it's working on them. And and maybe because because they get to just sort of they're not waiting, you know, years for like payoff. Um, so maybe that'll help, you know, make the mythology stuff go down a little easier. I, it's a little tiresome for me. Usually. Well, I mean, you know what? I mean, it's funny you should say that because I mean, it's it is true. I think uh, what I'm noticing, because I'm asking. I mean, uh, th- that's the whole concept here, right? I sit down with longtime fans, and you know, uh, they sort of walk me through it as I go through the show on my first watch, right? And I am noticing that a great number of fans that I've talked to about it, you included, tend to prefer the Monster of the Week episodes. And here I am, and what I'm discovering as a viewer, as I'm going through it, I tend to gravitate towards the mythology episodes. Now, you just (laughs) mentioned that your kids are going through it, and they're totally buying, you know, they're getting sucked into the mythology. So it gives me the impression that it seems to be a retrospective thing. It seems to be like people looking back I guess because of where the mythology eventually goes, and you know, yeah. I mean, uh, that maybe when you look back, you go, yeah, you know, ultimately the payoff was kind of whatever, so I'm sticking with the monster of the week. And and one of the things that I've been talking with Daniel about is that how what I'm seeing is that the X Files is essentially two shows, two different television shows kind of smashed together. You have on the one hand a sort of serialized paranoia thriller with, uh, you know, the whole government conspiracy and the alien and all that stuff. And you have like a more, more of a sci-fi anthology show where, you know, you have these sort of standalone horror stories and you grab those two things and you smash them together and you get the X-Files, right? And so that's very interesting. And I think that you can actually, somebody could even do that. I'm sure somebody could do, to do the work of like, just grab, just grab all the mythology episodes and string them together and you have a serial grab all the monster of the week episodes and you have just like something like Friday the 13th, the series, you know? And so that's, that's ultimately, that's it, you know? And that's very interesting to me. I think it's, it's a very interesting 
aspect of this series. And that's why I'm going to be very interested in seeing how this evolves and how my opinion of it changes going through it. Uh, to some extent, the show was was a, a victim of the era that produced it in that um, it was the, you know, the, the needs of network television, right? I mean, cable, cable uh, uh, shows were not, peak TV was a couple years off. Uh, streaming was obviously not a thing. And so you had the 26 episode, 25 episode model that required a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You know, you needed you needed the one offs to to pad out your episodes and you needed to keep the mythology going in order to get to your syndication number. And and so I think the mythology is what what kept people, you know, it pulled people in. Uh, unfortunately, right. I think I, I think what what became clear as the show went certainly for me it was like by the time we got to the movie, I was like I don't think they like know yet how, how to wrap all this stuff up you know like it it sort of got too big just by virtue of trying to uh, like keep it going you know yeah I look at it like there's a tug of war you know between these two these two quote unquote shows that I described that you smashed together there is this tug of war going because what you said. I mean, when this came out, serialized television wasn't the norm. It just wasn't, right. yep. you know? And so any show that tried to do it, it was taking a kind of risk. And networks were very sort of reticent to do it. You had Twin Peaks doing it here. You had a couple of primetime soaps, I guess, who, that had done it in the past. And but, but really, for this kind of show, it just wasn't common. I mean, over, over on Star Trek The Next Generation and all its spinoffs, they really resisted serializing it even though the actual showrunners wanted to desperately they wanted to tell long stories they wanted to like have a lot of character growth and sort of serialize it but rick berman and everyone else in charge was like no way nope we're not doing that no 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 and so that's why you know you had the all that trouble with ds9 and even with voyager or whatever you had these things where they they were resisting what the show should be right yeah. and and here they were sort of like trying to have it both ways where uh, where, but I think that maybe a show like The X Files, maybe it works better as a standalone thing, as a, as a sort of week to week thing, as, than to have a serialized arc, especially if it's a serialized arc that you're sort of making up as you go along, which, mm -hmm. from what you're saying, clearly seems to be the case. So, uh, yeah, that's the tricky thing. But now it's just that <laughs> you look at it now. You look at it now, and most shows are serialized. Most most shows do tell like a long story over 15 or 16 episodes. And so you you expect that, and that's one of the reasons why probably your kids gravitate towards it, and why I am also like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting into it, I'm getting invested. I'm already kind of telling myself, you know, it's about the journey, it's about the journey, the destination is probably going to suck, but just, you know, enjoy <laughs> enjoy it while it's going. And so that's sort of where I am here. And then, you know, the, the other to, to the other point you made about how those episodes now don't feel like there's a there's a weirdness to them given where we are today in society and our socio-political climate today um and it's because uh, another someone else brought this up a few weeks ago clay brought this up um a couple of times now about where the x-files sits today you know mm -hmm. how a show like the x-files with that stuff sits today given the 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 climate so I'm, I'm kind of interested in your thoughts because you brought up the, the topic yeah what what clay said was something to the extent of i mean he he gave a very mild spoiler uh to the revival season which i haven't seen i assume you have so maybe you I, can I, give... I saw i saw the event series i didn't see the the second of the new series okay okay but uh he brought up that there was a character on that series, I think played by Joel McHale, mm -hmm. who's like an who's kind of like an Alex Jones kind of yeah, that's right. character, right? And he said how uh, mild spoiler, but whatever, it's years from now for me. Um, he said how that character is ultimately proven right, and he said that 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 upset him. That that like he said this isn't you know I don't like that an Alex Jones character is being painted in a sympathetic light or, or just being proven right. You know, yeah, these are supposed yeah. to be the kooks. These are supposed to be the, you know, what the fuck, you know, yeah. uh, would, would, uh, Mulder today be a QAnon, QAnon that, guy? I mean, is that what that would I mean, be, you know? Right. I mean, look at the lone gunman, right? You're telling me they wouldn't be like Reddit, uh, denizens, you know, like, yes. 
Yes, it's upsetting. It's upsetting. It's it's yeah. it's upsetting when like real life catches up to the fiction. Like when real life catches up to the pulp fiction that you're enjoying, that is supposed to be escapism. And so when real life starts to become as crazy as the escapist fiction, then you kind of go like, okay, well now it's making me uncomfortable. Now it's you know making what's me funny is, is I'm, I'm currently going through, I think I'm just doing like shows that started in 93 because I'm also watching NYPD Blue with my wife. Um, <laughs> All right. and, and we're watching it, you know, and, and obviously you watch it. I don't know if you're familiar with the show, but you know, Dennis Franz is Andy Sipowitz. He's like the, yeah. The, the lovable curmudgeon, you know, and, and there's one episode yesterday we were watching where he's commenting on these, uh, there's like a, a Russian mail order bride who's killed. He's like, you know, all these people who come over here and they make this country worse or something like this. And I turn to my wife, I'm like, Sipowitz would probably be a Trump voter, right? Like, <laughs> oh, he absolutely, he completely would be. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the show. I mean, I've seen a handful of episodes here and there and I'm familiar with the character. So I'm, I'm just going like, yes, exactly. That's exactly, yes. And, and on the one hand you go, you know what, that's compelling. It's good to have uh, multi-dimensional characters in your show. Um, it's perfectly fine to have like a, a central character who maybe is not squeaky clean, who maybe is not like he's more of an anti-hero type. But what can be upsetting about that is when those figures are then lifted up as heroic by yes. people who are who are not who are just getting another read on what like a show could be making a comment, you know, uh, on that, on that sort of person. And you know what? Yes, our main character is going to be racist and he's going to be this and he's going to be that. OK, fine. I bigot. And, you know, he's the main character of the show. And so you will have complicated feelings as you watch this program, as you're sympathizing with this bigot, you know. And but you'll have people who are, no, he's 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 the hero and he's right. And you're like, no, you're kind of not getting it. You're not, you know, <laughs> and then you wonder, OK. Is is it that you're not getting it, or is it that I'm not getting it? Is it is it that I, you know, <laughs> you know? So that that's where it makes you uncomfortable. It's the same as you know, whatever Fight Club or whatever it is, where people don't seem to get what the story is actually trying to tell you about yourself and about society. And so, I guess you could apply that same um, reasoning to the X Files. That it is a paranoia thriller that was you know trying to criticized the government. Uh, Chris Carter, famously very anti-authority, very like mistrusting of the government, mistrusting of authority, uh, puts that into his shows time and time again. But I think that, yeah, it becomes that balance. Because if you've got like an Alex Jones and you're making him right, then, then you have to ask yourself, what exactly is this? So... Again, I say it will be interesting to watch it and see the show evolve because it comes from a more innocent time when this sort of thing could be seen as mere escapism. And now it's starting to mirror reality in an uncomfortable way. So I guess we'll see. But uh, now let's talk about this episode. Let's talk about uh, Humbug, which uh, which is a really good episode, I thought. I, um, I, you know, I don't know if I had ever seen it before. I certainly didn't remember if I had seen it before, um, which I guess I didn't because it's quite memorable. So I think I'd remember if I'd seen this episode before. Um, and it was, it, it's, it's very interesting. And since you're the fan, I'd like to first hear your take on it. Uh, you know, I, it, this one, I, I remember seeing it when it came on uh, originally and I hadn't seen it since. So, I mean, it was really, there, there were certain, uh, like you said, there, there was imagery that I remembered very distinctly, but the, the twists and turns were completely new for when I revisited it. And, uh, I it was it was interesting because 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 tonally it's very different from from the show up to this point. I mean, there, it's much more. I mean, it's not a comedy, but it is comedic. Right. Yes. Right. Definitely. And, yes. And I think I think it really it it, it highlights uh, first of all Duchovny, like any chance he gets to just be deadpan. Uh, I'm I'm all about because he's really funny and and as yeah. the show goes on he gets funnier and I feel like this is the first time for me where it really like sticks out like oh this, this, you know we get some good lines from Mulder we get some good moments and the show itself is is sort of winking and nudging at the the conceit of the series itself and I think that's why it worked for me. Yeah, well, I mean to to that point, I mean this this is the first episode written by Darren Morgan. Uh, he had co he had contributed to the story for Blood earlier in the season, and now this is his first like full on script that he wrote. Uh, Darren Morgan, who's Glenn Morgan's brother uh, from the writing team, Glenn Morgan and James Wong. So, and it was his first uh, episode that he wrote for the show, and he comes from comedy. He's a comedy writer, uh, 
Hmm. And for him, it was a challenge, you know, because he was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm a comedy writer. This isn't really my thing. So I'm going to see what I can do. And clearly, and you can see that because as you said, the episode is funny. It may, be, it may not be a comedy in the strictest sense of the word, but uh, it is certainly very, has a lot of dark humor uh, throughout. And, the, and you're totally right that the tone is nothing like anything that we've seen. It, it sort of toes this line where it's, it's getting into this really weird area. You know, um, you're going down sort of a David Lynch, uh, Tim Burton path, you know, when, I guess very deliberately because of the, the subject matter of the show. You know, it, it is very much, it's Todd Browning's freaks. It's, it's, that's what it is. It's, it's going into that arena. So, right, I, I think that, and it's very deliberate. I mean, you ask people like, Vincent Chiavelli is in this, and I'm, I ask myself, did Vincent Chiavelli waltz over from like the Penguin Circus? Um, <laughs> right. Can, can we can we like do like the can we like have like a head cannon? Can we just say that it's the same character? Can, 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 can we just say that he just yeah yep the uh, the Vincent Chiavelli like the the, the like circus um, performer cinematic universe? I think that that's um you know it has interesting touches like that. Uh, you you talked about the twist. I mean. It's it's really no big twist, uh, in my opinion, at least, uh, who the killer turns out to be. I, I didn't think it was that that hard to guess. I mean, in the, in the very beginning, maybe, but as soon as you see Vincent Chiavelli and he's got the con, the conjoined twin and the whole thing going on, I was like, oh, I see. Okay, so the, I, mean, I, I just that was immediately what leapt into my brain, especially yeah, because yeah. You, you see brief shots of it, like when when when, when he's attacking it, and um, it's pretty good effects. I mean. I was reminded of uh, of Belial, you know, from Basket Case. Uh, oh, sure. That was that was the first thing that popped into my head, and I, I think they expected you to be reminded of Belial since it is a conjoined twin kind of thing. And I was also reminded of the baby, the killer baby from the movie It's Alive. So, the those two things sort of I was like the way that the little creature effects were pretty decent, pretty like uh, startling, and used just enough where they don't overdo it because, you know. If you linger too long on that thing, it probably wouldn't look that great. But since they just show you these quick flashes of it, it's very effective. I had a thought. I wonder if Jim Rose and the Enigma uh, continue to have any uh, cultural value uh, today. I don't, I mean, um, I mean, they were a pretty big deal, I guess, quote unquote, back in 95 in like the underground right. music. They've been on like Lollapalooza and whatever else. I mean, they were, I think Jim Rose had like a show or, or something. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but like the Enigma was like on magazines and whatnot. And I was reminded, again, this this takes you back to to the <laughs> era in which it was made. So I was taken back to 95 when, all oh, right, this is on the news and, you know, Lollapalooza and et cetera. And I wonder, like, do they continue to have any kind of cultural value today? I, I can't imagine. I mean, it, it that feels very specifically... Uh, nailed down to that era, if you will. Yeah, very much so, I think. Um, but, okay, so this is a story about uh, circus freaks who, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm using the language of the show, not, not my own language. Um, <laughs> and uh, th th these people uh, who were former circus, you know, they, they were part of a circus. And then, I, I, at least I, I think I got this, they now run a hotel, right? Like that's that's essentially yeah. um, to understand that. And like the the alligator man from the beginning uh, is now just a suburban father, like just a suburban dad who just like I mean, does he even still work for the circus? Like that's there was there was an aspect there that was a little confusing. It's it's the cold open, so maybe you know. But when he first shows up, and they they pull that sort of um, you know they do that little they trick you you know into thinking that he's the monster, and then comes out of the water and oh no it's just he's just their dad and right. and I was at first, I mean since I didn't know yet what was going on I was even a little confused because he he brings up something that I think he talks about a convention so I wasn't even sure at first I was like oh so is he just made up that way and he just he just didn't bother changing when he got back from the convention or is he supposed to actually be a, a guy with like skin like that like I I wasn't clear until later when they talk about him once yeah. he's dead and then i said oh, okay so it was he was meant to be even though i don't think the actor was i mean i'm pretty sure it's an actor with makeup unlike yeah, some of the other people in the show but uh but in any case that that part was confusing to me so like i wasn't sure what i mean 
is the circus still operating? Is this, uh, I mean, that's the part that I was a little bit unclear on. That's actually a good question. I just assumed that it was still operating. <laughs> right. Well, because they make this whole big thing, because when, when Mulder and Scully are investigating, they go, they check into Michael Anderson's hotel. And, and you know, there's that whole thing where he asks if he's a former employee of the circus. And then, of course, that whole speech, right. oh, well, of course, I must be in the circus, right, right since, I'm, <laughs> since I'm a midget or whatever he says, right? And so, like... The, they're making a point of that, you know. They're they're, they're making, and then even later when Vincent Chevalier is walking uh, Scully to her room, I call him Vincent Chevalier. The character's name is Leonard. <laughs> when 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 Leonard is walking Scully to her room, and you know he says something to the effect of, uh, "I was given this job now as like basically the you know the concierge or whatever, um, as a, to restore my dignity." You know, like, like Michael Anderson gave him that job. He was a former, and so that's why I'm thinking, okay, so he's a former. He, he used to be in like this, the, the sideshow or the circus or whatever this was. And now to quote unquote restore his dignity, he's now just an employee at this hotel and just lives a normal life or whatever it is, right? So that, that's why like that, that's the part that was confusing to me because like you have that and then you have uh, Jim Rose and the Enigma who are whatever, Dr. Blockhead and the conundrum in this show. <laughs> <laughs> and they are they are guests at the hotel uh, like that because that's something that I didn't even realize until the end. Like yeah. I thought they were part of it, but no, they're they're just staying there. They're just traveling. They're just passing through, right? Isn't that what's happening? I I thought it was they're they're with the circus, and then at the end, it's like kind of like there there's no there's no act anymore. So they're moving on. I didn't I didn't get the sense that they're passing through like i thought they were with the circus and they're moving on at the end oh, okay all right because it was because for me it was i mean that whole ending it's it's uh it's the yeah you know we know the conundrum ate the dude and so now like he they just i, I okay they, they want to get the hell out of here before anybody realizes what happened right or that's that's how i understood it yeah. but the fact that they're just leaving, you know, they're just packing their stuff and leaving i mean i guess they were they had some kind of a show going on because you have that whole the whole funeral, right? Right. And where that he crashes the funeral, doing his act, comes out of the ground and whatever, in tribute to, he refers to as an escape artist. But he he also says that he didn't know him personally. He just, you know, and so I think, well, if he didn't know him personally, then I guess they didn't work together. So I guess the guy no longer worked at the circus or at the sideshow or whatever. So. Th those are little little pieces that are not clear. I don't think they matter so much to the story or anything, but they are a little bit unclear. It's a little bit, yeah. they yeah, were confusing. Yeah. They confused me as I was watching the episode. But it is basically, it's a town where they've all, it's a community at least, where they've all kind of settled, right? Because you have the sheriff, who we later find out used to be the Jim Jim the dog face boy. And now he's the sheriff of the town. And then, you know, Scully goes to investigate at a museum, which is essentially kind of like a, a low-key Ripley's, I guess. Right. And the guy that runs it is also a, a, a person with a deformity, you know. Um, they don't really go into details as to what, what that was or if he was a... So that's why, like, I wonder what this is. Is it a town full of... It, there's, a, there's an element to it that seems almost like uh, outside of reality, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you're talking about basically a whole town that seems to just be where these people have settled because here in this town, they feel safe, I guess. I mean, I, I'm like, what, what, what is your, what are, what are your, what's your take on that? Well, there's, there, I mean, and maybe just because of, uh, Michael Anderson, but the, there's a heavy Twin Peaks vibe. Yes, uh, definitely. Yes. Right. And, and yeah, so I mean, what you say, like, uh, off off to one side of reality, I think that's that's very apropos. Yeah, it it, it feels. Um, I mean, it's I mean, it's interesting right? because because uh, the 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 episode treats the what could be, uh, you know, really horrific with very much of a light touch, and I think um, that that allows for uh, a, a kind of a unique egress into into this topic. I mean, I mean, like you said, like Todd Browning and freaks and stuff. I mean, that's. This stuff is pretty horrifying, you know, in my opinion. Sure. And, and this doesn't go, it doesn't go full browning, you know what I mean? It, it, it chooses to be 
uh, a little more deft with it. And I think that's a, yeah, I think that's what makes the episode work. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you there. I think that the reason it works is because it balances things. You know, it it's a darkly humorous piece that is sort of showcasing these people um, in the way that Todd Browning's Freaks was meant to do, but of course with a lighter touch, because I think ultimately it's trying to balance it out. It's trying to really, at at its core, I think the goal is for it to be a humanistic piece um, about otherness, I guess, right? So that's why it works because it it has a compassionate lens. It's not just showcasing the freakishness of them, it's showcasing their humanity. And it deserves a lot of credit for that, I think, because as you said, that's why the episode works. And I think that's why it deserves a lot of credit because it could have very easily just been a freak show, you know? And it doesn't want to do that. It wants to just be, uh, I mean, it wants to be an interesting little mystery story, but it also wants to showcase these people as human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. you know, with wants and needs and desires. And that's, that's its value. That's its value. It's a little on the nose about its intentions, <laughs> right? Right at the very end, when like Jim Rose is the whole, like, you know, soon we'll have like, what something to, to the extent of like genetic engineering and everybody's going to look like him pointing. Like, yeah, he's to, like standing like, there with this <laughs> heroic pose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, we're not going to have these genetic, uh, um, you know, fallacies or wh whatever word he uses. I don't, I'm just paraphrasing, but uh, so it's very clear trying to say that, you know, it's, it's trying to highlight that these deformities or these conditions make people that, that, you know, we look at them, their it's their, their otherness or whatever, but in, in reality, what it results is in, is in a uniqueness that should be celebrated. So clearly, this, like that is the point of the episode. And you, I, the sheriff, in fact, goes like, you know, he he keeps correcting the terminology that they're trying to use when they're talking to him. He was like, we prefer, I don't know what he says. He, uh, what does he say? I don't remember that. I should have written it down. But something to the to the extent of like, you know, we prefer this term as opposed to what, because Scully's all like, oh, he's, you know, she's practically calling them freaks, you right. know, and and the sheriff's sort of like, hey, 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 hey you know. Come on that's, now. That's, that's not, you know, that's not the right word to use. We prefer this or that. That's right? our word for us. You don't get to call us that. That's exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's basically that's basically what he says. Although at that moment we don't realize that he's one of them. But yeah. um, but that's essentially what he is saying. And so all of that like is is intriguing. The the other thing is that the, the dynamic that this story, by the nature of the way the story is told, uh finally has, once again, you have an example of Scully, who is always a skeptic, actually start to experience these things firsthand, see them up close, and start to sort of have a sense of wonder about what's happening, right? The way that Mulder usually acts, whereas Mulder is very low-key about it all. He's very kind of like, huh, you know? The, the, only, the only part where he gets kind of like, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's a great line where he says that whole thing where he goes like, you know, with the right sort of discipline, you can have your testicles like, <laughs> like rise, <laughs> go into your stomach, and and he was like that. I think that's happening right now. And, <laughs> you know, so like, uh, that's cool. And I don't know, like, I, but I do. Do you see what I'm talking about? Like the whole sort of reversal. This is one of those episodes where they kind of switch roles. Where yeah, a little bit. I totally agree. Yeah. You know, she's all like, whoa. Yeah. What the hell, you know, and and then and and he's more like, yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> yep, that's that's what it is, and and it's not. There's no, like, even at the very end, you know, when he's like, but I saw him, I saw him. It's like, are you sure you saw that? Are you sure it wasn't like the merman or whatever it was, the the uh, the mermaid, the the Fiji mer, the, what was it? What, what was the name of the uh, character that I did write that down? Let me look that up. Let me see. Um, yeah, it was the, the, the Fiji mermaid, I think, right? Yeah, the Fiji mermaid. Right, so, and then the, the sheriff kind of, like, very annoyed. And he's just like, ah, are you sure that's what you saw? Are you sure it wasn't the Fiji mermaid or whatever? And then and Mulder's just like, you're starting to sound like me. And so that's that's funny that they did that. And clearly they did it very deliberately. But, uh, but yeah, like, like, what's your take on that? You know, the, the, 
the fact that here we are, let's say almost two seasons in, and I mean, they're still insisting on Scully being the skeptic, even though by now she has experienced many amazing things that would have to challenge that yeah. skepticism. And yet she still holds on to it. Except that's, I mean, that's, that's one of those things that definitely like it feels uh, sort of indentured to the, the network model of the time, you know, where uh, you still needed to have, uh, you know, a show's, uh, uh, you know, log line uh, permeate for the entire series. Well, Mulder's this guy and Scully's this enough, you know, and like you say, like it, it, it goes down a little harder now because you're like, dude, you're just being obtuse at this point. Yeah. Like given, given the, the sheer volume of things you've seen, the fact that you're not even like entertaining the possibility. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I mean, I, I'm aware that uh, eventually, uh, yeah. you know, as, as the story progresses, maybe she does start to open up a little bit more. But yeah. I do think that ultimately that is her sort of, I mean, that is the paradigm of the show, as you were saying. And, and that's, and there you go with the tug of war, because since it, it since it has to balance between being a sort of serialized story, but also being a kind of one and done thing. And for syndication purposes, maybe episodes are watched out of order, or it's the sort of thing where you don't watch it week to week, you just watch it now and then, and like when you catch an episode. So the status quo has to be maintained. And that's a very, that, that's, that's murder on storytelling, really. Like that, you know, on, on, on character development and storytelling. And I can only imagine it must have been torture for the writers, you know, to, to have to figure out ways to twist themselves into pretzels to continue to justify that status quo, even after everything that had happened, you yeah. know, up until that point in the show. So I, I, I can, I sympathize with, the, it must have been really difficult for them, you know, that totally they, could, they couldn't just develop the character. They had to, they had to do it through a very slow process over like eight seasons. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, this this is a really good episode. I enjoy it. It's it was a lot of fun to watch. Um, but uh, so, I, is there anything that you'd like to bring up about it that we haven't talked about? No, I think we covered all the bases. I mean, it, you know, this one does stand out as being, you know, I when rewatching it now, you know, what what I'm appreciating is every time uh, the show experiments with the formula because what that allows for is just being able to do more. Uh, under this umbrella title, the X Files, and that's you know that's something that that's going to end up paying dividends throughout the course of the run because it's it's uh, the you know by this point in the run the show was doing well enough that they felt more confident uh, and able to experiment with the formula and I think I think that's that's just good uh, for for sort of creatively energizing the people making it and then I, it ends up being good for us who are watching it. Right. No, absolutely. And it's like what, what you were saying up front, that when you started watching the show, it was sort of a cult thing. Um, it wasn't quite the phenomenon, right? But I do think that that whole phenomenon aspect, I think it happened relatively quickly, right? Yeah, about, about I mean, by, by this point in the show, uh, in, in the run, because this is the second season, end of the second season. So, yeah, yeah it had like, it had... Uh, it, it was still like a cult hit, but it was on its way up. I think by season three, like three through you know seven, it was like a mainstream top twenty hit. Right. Yeah. Where you have, uh, where you've got like you know twenty million viewers or whatever. You know, it's yeah. it's just this. Obviously, it's a huge it's a huge hit. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that it definitely struck a nerve. I think it's a show that came at the right time. But uh, but the, re the reason I say that like it's on its uptick is because of that. Because by this point, although it's still culty, the fact that, well, you know, they were given a bigger budget, clearly, for the second season. It's much more polished than the first season. Yeah. And also things like this, you know, stunt casting, getting, you know, Jim Rose and the Enigma, uh, Jim, yeah, Jim Rose and the Enigma to uh, to guest on the show and sort of showcase that because it's ultimately it boils down to stunt casting they're not they're not great actors neither of them are great oh. actors but they're but they're basically doing their shtick they're doing their shtick on the show and that's what they were hired to do and it's fine and, you know this, this has been a fun talk of, of, i've enjoyed uh, sitting down and talking with you about this 
And now I'd like to throw it to you to sort of uh, tell our listeners where they can find you. Uh, well, you can uh, find my writing at the San Francisco Chronicle, where I do uh, TV and movie reviews for them. Actually, just a couple months ago, uh, I did a, a piece looking at uh, great shows to binge watch uh, for Halloween. And of course, that gave me a chance to talk about the X-Files. So any any chance uh, I can I can hype up the X-Files, I'm always happy about that. Uh, and if you're looking to hear more of me, uh, you check out the Movie Film Podcast, which I co-host with my partner, Brian Hall. Uh, we do bi-weekly film news and headlines and new releases, and then every other week we do a, uh, a, a movie commentary track and some of our most recent ones. Um, by the time you're listening to this, uh, the Star Wars The Force Awakens and uh, Tremors uh, are some of our recent ones. Oh, well, that sounds great. Um, that, that's uh, I'm definitely going to be putting some links in the episode description so people can check that out. And um no, that, that sounds really good, man. I, I really do think that uh, the uh, listeners should check that out. So I want to thank you again for joining me. And uh, thank you. we'll be talking again in the future. Awesome. Thanks so much. You took one quick look at me and decided that you could deduce my entire life. Never would it have occurred to you that a person of my height could have possibly obtained a degree in hotel management. I'm sorry. I meant no offense. Well, then why should I take offense? Just because it's human nature to make instantaneous judgments of others based solely upon their physical appearances? Well, I've done the same thing to you, for example. I've taken in your all-American features, your dour demeanor, your unimaginative necktie design, and concluded that you work for the government, an FBI agent. But do you see the tragedy here? I have mistakenly reduced you to a stereotype a caricature, instead of regarding you as a specific, unique individual. But I am an FBI agent. And that is that. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. And if you did enjoy it, there are many ways you can support the podcast, which is available on Anchor FM, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other platforms. You can subscribe. You can rate and or review it depending on what platform you're enjoying it on. And of course, you can share and spread the word on social media. Please do any or all of these things. Every little bit helps. Look for the Eric Santuan Network on Facebook or on YouTube. You can also follow me on Twitter at ericsantuannet and check out my film reviews on Letterboxd. Be sure to look into Zaki Hassan's work as a film critic and podcaster and there should be helpful links to do so in this episode's description. I'm Eric's Antoine, and I'll be back in a week or so to discuss the Kalasari, which has to do with demonic possession, but not in the manner we are normally accustomed to by mainstream horror. Anyway, please do stay tuned for that episode, and remember that the truth is out there. See you next time.